Welcome to Forward Fest. We are so glad that you are here engaging in bold ideas, varied approaches, and thinking forward. All that make Princeton the special place that it is. We want to hear from you throughout a year of forward thinking, and particularly now during Forward Fest. So be sure to tag any of your forward thinking social media posts with hashtag Princeton Forward. That includes any questions or comments you may have for the Princetonians you will soon see. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of our Thinking Forward Justice session, Bria Gillum from the Princeton class of 2003. Bria is a program officer for criminal justice at the MacArthur Foundation. She will be leading us through a thoughtful discussion with our four forward thinkers today. Bria. Hi everyone, and welcome to Princeton University's Forward Fest and today's session, Thinking Forward Justice. My name is Bria Gillum, class of 2003, and I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm really looking forward to a thought-provoking discussion on various ways that Princeton researchers are approaching questions around policing and criminal justice in the US and beyond, and what their findings can teach us about potential paths forward. I'm thrilled to be joined today by four of Princeton's forward thinkers in this area. With us are Professor Aisha Belicio de Jesus, Professor of American Studies, Director of the Program in American Studies, Program in Asian American Studies, and Program in Latino Studies, and Co-Director of the Center on Transnational Policing. Professor Jonathan Mamolo, Assistant Professor of Politics and Public Affairs. Professor Lawrence Ralph, Professor of Anthropology and Co-Director of the Center on Transnational Policing. And Professor Patrick Sharkey, Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs. We will start our first session by welcoming Professors Sharkey and Professor Mamolo. Welcome both of you. I thought it would be helpful if you could sort of just take a couple of minutes, introduce yourselves to the audience and just hear a little bit more about your research. So Professor Mamolo, I'll start with you. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Jonathan Momolo. I'm an assistant professor in, in politics and public affairs here at Princeton. Uh, I study policing in the United States um, and from a number of angles. So I, I study what, how and, uh, and where um, controversial, aggressive police tactics are deployed. Um, I do a lot of work to develop new and improved uh, statistical techniques for measuring uh, racial bias in policing that take account of um, deficiencies in policing data that have in the past uh, led researchers to actually understate uh, the degree to which uh, policing is racially biased. Um, and then I also apply those techniques um, in a number of ways to uh, study the efficacy of various proposed reforms like um, increased oversight on police officers and uh, the role of diversity uh, inside uh, police agencies. Great, and Professor Sharkey, you wanna introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, sure, hi everyone, and thanks, Bria. Um, so my name is Pat Sharkey. I came here to Princeton just last year, so I'm a professor of sociology and public affairs here, and you know, a big part of coming here was being able to interact with people like Jonathan and Lawrence and Aisha, so this will be fun, this panel will be fun. My research focuses primarily on urban inequality uh, I, look at, I look at inequality across space, across neighborhoods, cities, regions of the U.S. And as part of that work, I started to focus more and more attention on violence. I kind of think of, of violence as a central uh, component of urban inequality, both in, in terms of, of its effects on cities, but also our responses to it. So that's what kind of brings me to this panel. Great. Thank you both. So I'm really excited to have this conversation as we're sort of thinking about transforming our police systems, really changing our criminal justice system and thinking about shifting our investments to community resources. So Professor Bamola, I wanna start with you on the policing angle, since that has really sort of been in front and center with just the most recent killings of too many black people to name quite frankly. But I, your perspective is a little bit unique because you're talking about the need for better data collection and analysis and the need to really mitigate racial bias that we see in police data. 
So I'm curious, sort of in this year of 2020, where we're thinking about transformational change, how do you see the work that you're doing as part of the solution to change policing? And particularly, I wanna focus on the over-policing of people of color. Sure. Um, well, there's, I think, a number of things uh, that I've discovered in my work that um, could be helpful in this in this discussion and in this broader project. Um, so one is uh, studies of basically the efficacy of various aggressive police tactics, um, such as militarized policing or the deployment of SWAT teams, which tend to be concentrated in Black communities. Um, these are tactics that were developed uh, with the explicit goal of responding to uh, violent emergencies, such as sort of like active shooter situations. But over the years, have have become a a, a daily uh, practice in policing, and, and are overwhelmingly used for more routine policing activities, like the service of search warrants. Um, and the justification for that is that um, uh, p police chiefs would say, many police chiefs would ha have said, uh, it keeps officers safer uh, to use militarized equipment and, and use militarized tactics, and it keeps the public uh, safer as what well, lowers crime rates. And um, through recent uh, data collection and analysis, scholars have actually begun to test those claims for the first time. And it actually turns out that neither of those claims is supported by the data. There's no evidence that acquiring and using SWAT teams or acquiring militarized equipment um, is uh, is lowering crime in communities or keeping officers safer, and there and there've been a number of similar studies for other tactics like uh, like stop, question, and frisk, which was expanded in major cities across the country uh, on similar uh, 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 pr uh, proposed uh, on the grounds of similar proposed benefits that it would keep the public safer, keep officers safer. Whenever someone takes a close look and analyzes data properly, those benefits just aren't there. So I think what that shows is that there's a number of things police agencies can do in the near term on their own authority to just scale back the use of these aggressive tactics that have been um, widely expanded in recent years um, with little with little trade-off. Right? The, the trade-off that they thought was there in terms of safety does not seem to be there. Um, in addition, uh, a lot of the work I do is about sort of how to how to accurately diagnose the problem of racial bias in policing, um, given the fact that a lot of the data we have is deficient in many ways. Um, and I think that's an important project because we have 18,000 police departments in the country. They may vary considerably in the degree to which discriminatory practices are going on. And we need to be able to, to quantify this problem so we can devote resources where they're most needed. Um, and uh, we also need to be able to measure improvements, right? So if we if we invoke if we um, enact reforms uh, aimed at mitigating this problem, we need to be able to measure whether they're working um, or whether we need to try something else. Um, and uh, so that's just I think a couple ways um, that I think my work speaks to that. Yeah, I want to follow up on the point that you made that there's you know eighteen thousand different police departments just across this country. And there's sort of a question about data standardization. How do you um, allow for greater data accountability and transparency, particularly for communities? How do you sort of help them understand and translate the data that they're getting from the police? So do you have some recommendations for how police departments can do a better job at you know, being accountable to the communities that they're serving and also just being more transparent in their data collection and analysis? Yeah, I think we need sort of a, a transparency revolution in, in policing. Um, and I actually don't think it need, it should be um, relegated to agencies to take this on. I think we need like a national mandate to collect and disseminate uh, data on policing, um, you know, which would probably require some sort of funding at the national level. Um, for decades, we've had a really robust um, system of collecting data on crime that the national government heads up. Um, that data is imperfect and it's incomplete, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty substantial program. Um, we have next to no uh, data in, in terms of a nationwide scope on what police do every day and where they do it. Um, and, and finding those, those basic things out is sort of, uh, first of all, I think something citizens have the right to know. And second, sort of, it's sort of just like the building blocks of how to start to understand these problems. So for example, one, one uh, type of data that I think police departments should make available um, is where uh, police officers are deployed, um, and uh, and and further, what are the decisions that go into into those deployments? 
Um, so I've recently obtained historical deployment data in the city of Chicago, and they allow uh, for research into a number of pressing questions that have been obscured by past data deficiencies. So, uh, for example, if you know where officers are deployed, then you can compare officers of different groups who are facing similar circumstances at the same time, which has been sort of like a fundamental challenge in policing research. Uh, for example, if we want to know who are the problem officers, or we want to know would deploying more black officers as opposed to white officers make a difference in how police do their jobs, we need to be able to make all else equal comparisons, which means we need to know where police are when they're doing their jobs, right? We need to compare officers working in the same times and places. And so that deployment data has allowed us to do that. And we actually find there are substantial differences between how different groups of officers perform when facing the same conditions, um, many of which are in line with the hopes of reformers who advocate diversity in police. Professor Sharkey, I wanna also bring you into this conversation, similar on the question about accountability and transparency. I think the same is true very much for the work that you're doing with a focus on looking at communities and community investment um, and sort of diverting resources away from law enforcement, criminal justice efforts in particular, because it's often the communities that have the solutions and then they're the ones, quite frankly, that know what safety looks like. So I'm curious, can you sort of help us think about what would that sort of shift to a community oriented model look like? And how would we less rely on our typical actors of the criminal justice system, whether it be police or prosecutors or judges, so on and so forth? Yeah, Bria, it's a great question. So when we think about how to deal with violence, our default response is to turn to the institutions of, of law enforcement and the prison system. That's what we've done for a long time. Um, and some of the research that had that I've done has just looked to other institutions and communities, institutions that we know kind of play a central role in looking out over a community, making sure everyone is safe, making sure public spaces are, are safe, uh, young people are welcomed, uh, making sure nobody, no one falls through the cracks. Um, and, and so I think what the perspective that focuses entirely on uh, the institution of, of law enforcement and law enforcement, the criminal justice system, it misses the fact that there's really a growing body of evidence suggesting that these other community-led institutions can be extraordinarily effective in controlling violence. And, and this can take many different forms, but there's really rigorous evidence showing that redesigning abandoned lots so that they are public spaces that are used by the community, uh, running high quality after school programs, summer jobs programs, cognitive behavioral therapy, these, these kinds of programs, when they have sufficient investment, uh, are not just beneficial for the young people in, involved, but they have a, an extremely strong impact on violence. And that's generated from, from very rigorously evaluated uh, programs. So in kind of building off of that research, um, in some of my own work, I've looked nationally at what role do community institutions, and I'm focusing primarily on nonprofits, but it's a real range of, of institutions and religious congregations and, and kind of think about all the institutions that make up a, a, the foundation of a neighborhood. And I've tried to generate evidence to assess whether the uh, expansion or the growth of these kinds of institutions has a causal impact on the level of violence in the community. And so I started by kind of going back and looking at the uh, proliferation of the nonprofit sector in particular, and, and found that, that the expansion of the nonprofit sector in the 1990s should really be a central part of the story about why violence started to fall across US cities in the 1990s. It was, it was uh, partially a story about residents and local organizations that really mobilized to take back city streets, to make parks and playgrounds safe, uh, to make sure no one was dealing drugs in alleyways, to make sure uh, there was treatment for addiction and homeless services and after school programs. This was a central part of the story about why violence fell across the US. And so then the, the extension of this is, is I'm really trying to make the case that these kinds of organizations can play a central role in confronting violence. Um, if they have the resources to do it in a sustainable way, um, uh, these, these institutions just have never had that same commitment. But I'm arguing that, that if we think about these as 
as kind of core organizations and institutions in the fight to confront violence, uh, then, then we can develop an alternative to our heavy reliance on the police and the prison. Yeah, I mean, you both have sort of touched on this issue of resources, right? I mean, Professor Mamolo said, perhaps we need to think about a national mandate or some type of federal investment for better data and transparency. I'm curious, Professor Sharkey, do you sort of think we need more federal investments as well to sort of get to uh, more investment and resources back into communities? Quite frankly, that did happen as you were explaining, um, historically it did happen and then there was a huge shift um, you know, over the last 50 years or so where we started putting more money back into law enforcement and criminal justice system actors as opposed to communities themselves. Yeah, so with this, with this growing body of evidence suggesting that residents and community organizations uh, can be extremely effective in, in confronting violence, I think you can build a case for an expansion of the investment given to these, these organizations. Um, you know, we have, we have invested very heavily, uh, particularly since the 1970s onward, uh, in the institutions of the criminal justice system. Uh, and we just haven't given the same investment to uh, local community organizations. And I think part of the reason is that we, we don't think about these as uh, organizations for violence prevention. You know, we think about these as feel-good organizations uh, that provide services to a community. But my hope is that a reframing, uh, really pointing to this growing body of evidence and arguing that these organizations actually hold up the social order within a community and in the process make communities safe, make communities stronger. If we point to that, uh, these types of investments as investments for violence prevention. The hope is that then this starts to shift uh, the mindset of policymakers as they think about how to confront violence and, and really um, uh, that turns into larger investments in these kinds of institutions. And I just wanna stay on this point um, a little bit more because there's often some hesitancy to think about investments in community. There is more of a commitment to maintain the status quo more of this fear that if we divert money away from criminal justice efforts, then we'll see a spike in crime. But we know that the data says that's also not true. I'm wondering if you can sort of point us to some examples that you're talking about in local communities who have done this, um, that we can look to, you know, sort of as demonstration models or just other examples that would really help provide some guidance that it's really not that difficult or challenging. Um, to sort of commit to this type of investment in the first place. Yeah, I think it, it is a challenge in, in the sense that um, it requires the uh, the hard work of residents and community leaders to kind of build the types of institutions that can be sustained over a long period of time. And then it's a, a lot of work to make sure a community doesn't go downhill, to make sure that there are uh, members of the community who are see it as their responsibility to make sure that playground stays safe, make sure that child feels welcomed when, when she walks down the street. So, you know, this is a hard work that goes on day by day to make communities good places to live. Um, and I think we take this for, for granted. Um, but that the kind of investment that is needed to support the local organizations that do that work uh, has never been consistent. Uh, it has never been a, a consistent federal or state in investment. So there are there are examples uh, of communities that have transformed in time. I write a lot about East Lake Atlanta, uh, which you know, back in the early 1990s was an intensely violent section of Atlanta uh, and received a tremendous amount of investment, mostly from private sources, uh, but also with the assistance of the local tenants association and with the support of, of residents started to transform over time. It started to transform because there was an institution that was formed called the East Lake Foundation, which 
they called a community quarterback because they organized a plan for transformation and they had the resources necessary to carry out that transformation. So it's not without controversy there. This is a hard process uh, and it's not, it's never smooth. It's never without controversy, but over time, this investment in this institution and then in the schools and the public spaces and housing transformed that neighborhood so that it is now a fantastic place to raise kids where Back in the late 80s and early 1990s, I think everyone would agree that it was just a it, it was a it was a tough section of Atlanta. It was a terrible place to raise kids and people were trying to get out and not move in. And that has that has transformed entirely. Professor Mamolo, I want to ask you a question, um, because to sort of get to where Pat, uh, Professor Sharkey is going, I'm noticing um, on the technological side of policing, you're seeing a lot of investments in um, how data can help influence how law enforcement does their jobs, how they figure out what patrols they go in, who they target, how to surveil. Um, I live in Chicago where we see, quite frankly, on almost every corner uh, cameras that are um, being funded by Chicago Police Department to sort of monitor what's happening um, in the city. You see police body cameras as another example and sort of algorithmic policing. So I'm curious, if you were to sort of start your own police data department, sort of where would you prioritize what type of data collection would be helpful um, to sort of get to where Professor Sharkey is, you know, talking about and just thinking about community safety in a completely different way? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, my general view is that uh, data, you know, data can be used for good or it can be used for ill. The, the data collection per se is not necessarily a problem. In fact, it can be very empowering, I think, for societies to develop um, effective solutions to social problems. Um, you mentioned police body cameras. Um, they, I think, you know, have, have incredible promise that has not been realized yet because of uh, political decisions and departmental decisions about how they actually get used. Um, you know, they could provide, and in some cases have provided, objective streams of information about what happens during police civilian encounters in ways that uh, reports by police officers will never reliably be able to do. At the same time, um, we have very little oversight about how they're used. Officers, you know, often have discretion over when to turn them on. Um, agencies uh, uh, dispose of data after a certain period of time due to expense and don't have the person power to possibly review the hours of data that they collect. Um, so, I mean, one, one of the projects I'm working on with computer scientists at Princeton um, and uh, with colleagues at UPenn as well is to, is to develop ways of um, computationally summarizing the contents of body-worn camera data so that we can get objective uh, measures of what goes on during police civilian encounters. Um, that said, you know, that can all be used to inform like a range of a range of policies aimed at uh, reducing escalation to violence, for example. Um, that said, uh, departments, you know, can and have used data in ways that surveil populations in, uh, and violate people's civil civil liberties uh, to no benefit. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with things I was saying earlier, where departments sort of um, implement uh, abusive policies based on hunches about what those policies are going to deliver in terms of public safety and the ability of them to do their jobs. And I think it's precisely um, where rigorous social science can play a role to say, actually, your hunch is wrong. Um, you don't need to be using data in this way. You don't need to be deploying these tactics. And I think uh, Patrick's exactly right that we need to rethink, um, when we think about public safety, police cannot be the only thing that we think about. Um, and that uh, has, you know, has for too long uh, been the case. The best evidence we have on uh, on policing and public safety suggests, um, you know, there there's likely some deterrence effect to having police in a in a place at a time versus not having police, right? But it does it certainly doesn't eliminate crime. And so what what departments tend to do is they they say, well, how can we do better? And that's when they get into these aggressive tactics. Um, that violate people's rights and don't and don't deliver purported benefits. And so, if we're gonna if we're gonna try to tackle public safety beyond whatever marginal benefit police can provide, we need to be thinking creatively and um, talking about the types of, of civic efforts that Patrick's mentioning. That's great. I mean, I know we have just a couple of minutes left. You guys have really given us some great 
suggestions and ways to be more innovative and thinking creatively and also using a lot of mechanisms to empower people. I didn't know if you had sort of any last minute uh, remarks that you want to make before we sort of switch over to the next panel, um, but I did want to give you both the opportunity to do so. Well, what I would say, thanks for giving us this uh, this last word. Um, so what I would say is, is a lot of these debates uh, tend to revolve around the question of, of kind of um, how to dismantle an institution or how to reform an, an institution, which are central questions, um, but they are almost presented in moral terms uh, it, frequently. And and I guess what I would argue, and I think Jonathan's work is a, is a perfect example of these, we can we can answer these questions in empirical terms as well. And so when I talk about like the influence of community organizations on reducing violence, I'm making that case not because I think this is how the world should work, but I'm making that case because we have this extremely strong body of evidence suggesting that we can think about how to reduce violence in an entirely different way. OK, so there's one way of talking about this problem in terms of justice, uh, in terms of moral urgency, and that's crucial. And then there's another way of talking about this, this challenge in front of us in, in terms of evidence, in terms of data. And I guess one point that I think is sometimes effective in, in these kinds of conversations and debates is, is to really, if, if the, the discussion of justice is not persuading people, to talk about the evidence and really present this as this is, we actually have a really strong body of evidence suggesting that this will be at least as effective, if not more effective, without the costs that come from intensive surveillance and mass incarceration and aggressive policing. I want to hear Jonathan's last word. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really well said. Um, I think that uh, data and science uh, can really be an asset in this effort. Um, it's not the only piece of the puzzle, um, but the you know the more we can make informed decisions as we move forward, um, the more we're going to see progress uh, accrue more quickly. Um, sort of the first rule of of policy making is um, even well intentioned policies uh, can go awry and lead to unintended consequences, and we've certainly seen that on the part of police. Um, when you know when we contemplate reforms, we need to do so with the same care to the degree possible, and so I think that's that's one. Uh, that's the role I can play. And that's, you know, that's one piece of, of the effort of, of transforming policing. Great. Well, I do want to thank both of you for this really wonderful conversation. I know we will bring you back in about 30 minutes or so. Um, but for now, um, thank you both. Appreciate the, the discussion. And we will now speak to Professor Ralph and Professor Blicio de Jesus about a complementary different, but different set of approaches to these same issues. So they will be with me after this short break. Thanks, Priya. Thank you. Um, and we're back and I'm pleased to be joined with Professor Felicia de Jesus and Professor Ralph. Um, same as I did for the first panel, I would love for each of you to sort of take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to the audience. So I will start with you, Professor Felicia de Jesus. Thanks so much, Bria, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to participate in this wonderful conversation. Um, I'm a professor of uh, American Studies. I'm also the director of the programs in American Studies, uh, Asian American Studies, and Latino Studies at Princeton, and I am a cultural and social anthropologist. And my work really is comes out of um, a, a long history of doing research on uh, African and African diaspora religions in the United States. Um, and I started uh, researching for my first book um, 
and some of the, the elements that came out were around the sort of policing and criminalizing of African diaspora religions in the United States, in particular, um, the policing of Afro-Cuban Santeria and Haitian Vodun. And so during this research, um, I actually came upon um, a few dynamics that were, uh, that I found needed to be sort of uncovered to think more around what happens to particular religions, particularly immigrant religions of people, of Black and Latino, Afro-Latino people that come to the United States, um, whose cultures and practices aren't often recognized or seen as even sort of valid in many ways. Uh, and the practitioners themselves, um, you know, that I worked with had come to me and asked um, about if I could uh, look into this work. And so I began to do research uh, with police on how police were or were not trained on race and religion in particular. Um, and it actually coincided in, uh, this work started to happen in 2013 and coincided with um, uh, the, the the sort of uh, the, the eruptions in Ferguson. Um, and so I was doing active research with police officers um, across the United States looking at race and religion, but really uh, what was happening on the ground became um, just so important. As a result of this, uh, we decided to join together to really think about how we can address the question of policing from a, um, a few different angles. And so we have recently launched the Center on Transnational Policing in the Department of Anthropology here at Princeton, um, which has a number of uh, different initiatives that look at policing both in the U United States as well as internationally to think about what things are happening in the world and how we might, on the one hand, learn from certain things that are happening, but also think about the world as interconnected, right? How can we utilize um, you know, the, the, the techniques of qualitative ethnography to complement some of the great work that you had just heard in the previous panel around, around policing, uh, around police use of force, um, and, and police research. Um, so the, the Center on Transnational Policing is really a, a, a cross-disciplinary research hub that allows us to explore from a qualitative perspective how we might enhance um, the, the research on policing. So um, I'll, I'll stop there and, and I know that you have other questions. Great, and um, Professor Ralph, do you wanna introduce yourself as well to everyone? Sure. Um, I you mentioned you're, you're in Chicago right now, and I came to this issue of policing by actually uh, looking at urban violence in Chicago. And um, I, I moved into a low income neighborhood and lived there for several years. But one of the first things I, I noticed when I moved there, uh, as you also mentioned, was like the police surveillance cameras. And so, the what was interesting about it was this was like extremely low income neighborhood and the street lights didn't work so it was pitch black but at the end of the street there was a blue light police camera and so the the street was completely dark but you could see like right through my window through the blinds and everything i could always see and feel the pulsating blue light and um, it was just a stark uh, realization that you're always being surveilled in the community, even when physical police aren't around. It's a constant state of surveillance. It's a constant state of police presence. And so from that project, which ended up being about um, gang involved youth who had been shot and paralyzed and how they recovered. Uh, I ended up thinking more and more about policing through the lens of injury. And um, I went there studying violence. I ended up studying injury. And for me, the difference is not only the violence, but how people are recovering from violence. Uh, and injury for me entails the notion that there can be a repair and there can be healing. And so when I think about policing, I think about both the, the aspect of police violence, but also how communities are working to uh, heal themselves and how they're advocating for uh, reparative justice. Mm 
Yeah, it's so interesting also um, in the beginning when you mentioned you were able to see the blue light even though the street was pitch black. I think it also speaks to what the priorities are for a city right. oftentimes. You notice it's it's making sure that police can continue to surveil rather than thinking about the street lights that would help everybody in the community be able to see each other and to perhaps do other things that um, would lead to much more growth and opportunity as opposed to feeling like you are have someone else's eyes on you constantly. Um, so it's just, a, just sort of an interesting dichotomy. Exactly. I, I would love to sort of, I mean, both of you work for work on the uh, Center on Transnational Policing. And I'm curious um, because Professor Felicio de Jesus, you had mentioned how it's taking not just a national perspective, but also a global perspective. And especially again, in this time of 2020, we're seeing um, everybody sort of challenge the traditional roles of policing and saying, this is not what we want for our communities. This is not the types of investments that we're looking for. I'm curious sort of in your work for the center, are there certain models or examples that you're seeing that perhaps the United States should consider adopting? Yeah, thanks so much for that question, Bria. Um, I think this is, a, a, you know, such an important point is, you know, the, the world is interconnected and, and even, um, you know, the ways in which police forces train is an interconnected dynamic as well, right? Um, but in regards to your question, I think what is really compelling um, is to, to look at the figures around um, those places that don't carry, uh, where police do not carry weapons, right, or guns in particular. Um, and there's about 19 countries in the world where um, where guns are not uh, uh, sort of, you know, even really in use unless they merit, right? So there's this very special circumstances where guns are allowed. And in those countries, you seldom see um, death uh, or around incidents involving police, right? And so it's just a, a sort of very big example of how we might learn um, that the that uh, you know one of the bigger issues here is the question around weapons and guns and how that contributes to violence and death, right? Um, and and that's just a small point, but there's so many others um, in terms of um, what we can what we can look at. And I think that it, I think part of what we're thinking through is, you know, what what are the ways in which um, we see an increasing militarization of the police, right? And not just uh, abroad, but, you know, kind of the, the how weapons circulate even within our nation. Uh, we saw those weapons deployed in communities, um, you know, like Ferguson, in communities like Los Angeles, um, you know, for drug raids or for, for just, you know, um, sort of unnecessarily uh, having tanks and, um, and, and military grade, you know, SWAT team type type equipment um, to small towns, right? Um, and, and how these, uh, th these types of weapons really do impact everyday violence, right? Um, and that's, and it's part of what we're, uh, the aim of what we're trying to do in terms of the center on policing is to really complement the ways in which everyday police violence, um, it, although statistically we see a lot of, of numbers, what does that look like on the ground, right? How do we sort of translate real life experience where people, um, where people's communities and, you know, what Professor Ralph was describing in terms of like that blue light and, this, and the surveillance and, and how that violence really infiltrates and impacts, um, you know, just the, the, the cultural and social development of our youth. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you were saying sort of abroad, we're, it's almost like we're looking at violence as a, a completely different perspective, right? Here in the United States, we're much more reacting to violence that is happening and police are called because there's been some type of harm done to someone else. But it, it's almost as if in the, you know, internationally, it's sort of flipped. And I am sort of just curious, like, how how do we sort of change that shift? And quite frankly, this question can be for both of you too, because I think both of you would have great things to say on it, but sort of how do we shift that mindset where we're not looking for law enforcement to be responsive to quite frankly, way too many types of crimes um, that they don't need to be responding to, but also having them think about what their role is differently, not having to think about having a weapon first or, um, thinking about violence first. Are there sort of 
some things that you're seeing in your research or work that you're doing with the center that can sort of help us think about better really the role of law enforcement? Yeah, I can uh, take a stab at that. I mean, I think following the last session, a lot of it has to do with how we're thinking about public safety more broadly and whether we're reducing public safety to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there needs to be a, a more expansive notion of public safety. And both you, Rhea, and Pat mentioned these eras in American history where there was substantial governmental investment in uh, the American public and, and social uh, programs. But oftentimes, still during those periods, we see a racialized dimension where people of color are kind of left out of those opportunities. And so I think what that investment now could look like in this moment is making sure no one's left out, for example. Um, but also there is a way in which we need to see how the most vexing problems of our time are connected to each other. As Aisha is mentioning, the question of gun violence is connected to the question of policing and, and public safety. The, I, uh, the, the question of immigration is related to the question of policing and gun violence and safety. And so we can't attempt to solve these problems in a vacuum, but we need to understand the scale of the problem. In other words, this is a, this is a national uh, scale, well, it's a, actually a global problem on, uh, on the uh, scale of how we think of um, immigration or climate change or gun violence, right? It's one of those problems that we need uh, kind of uh, uh, to rethink about um, the, the national consciousness around the issue. And when we think about countries who are safer when it comes to the police, we see that they have a fundamental, a fundamentally different ethos around um, providing for the public. So it's no accident that some of the safest countries in the world are the Scandinavian countries, which have a different, totally different idea of the welfare state and, and healthcare and, and economic opportunities than the US. And so we have you know, we're so wedded to this notion of American exceptionalism oftentimes that we don't see how um, those things that we dismiss and say, oh, well, we can never do that because we just love our guns in the U.S. So we can never do that because we just have this individual bootstrap mentality, right? Those, those kind of things go hand in hand and we have to rethink um, the the exclusions that that kind of ethos is cementing in the public. But I think the good thing is that um, there is a new generation that doesn't think the same ways and aren't beholden to the same fair tactics when it comes to um, uh, ratcheting up public fear around particular populations. And so we need to seize on that and take advantage of the moment to, to rethink public safety. I mean, I think that's definitely true, especially what you're seeing right now, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, it's very much a younger generation that's leading that charge. Um, if you're thinking about other movements nationally that are happening about changing police structures, changing criminal justice altogether, it is that younger generation who's sort of not afraid to use their voice and speak out. Um, I'm curious, sort of, from your standpoint, Professor Belicio de Jesus, sort of how do you think about this activism and social movements that we're seeing now globally? Can you sort of talk about how they can lead to social, cultural, and political change? Yeah, no, I mean, it's so it's so foundational to um, you know how the world changes. And I think the only the only way you're going to see real transformation is from people demanding a change. And I think we see that, um, you know, very clearly right now that the Black Lives Matter movement has changed the world, right, today as we know it. Um, and not just because we see it on 
kind of NBA logos or you know floors, but really um, you know even the the discourse of, uh, of of our current election right has really been impacted and shifted um, to uh, acknowledge and recognize um, you know anti-black police violence. Um, and I think what we see right now in the um, the end SARS in Nigeria right is another movement that's coming out on um, police violence. A sort of grassroots movement that's looking uh, globally to um, to mirror, I think, in many ways, what's happening and what's happened in the United States and in solidarity and in and, and the Black Lives Matter movement itself is not a uh, a United States only uh, endeavor, but actually a global movement as well. So, um, so we see this happening right as we speak. Well, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, this time went by super fast, but we're not losing both of you. But I did want to give you both sort of, as I did in the first session, if there's sort of any last, sort of last minute, because you're all coming back, but like, you know, midpoint last minute remarks that you want to share with our audience. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think that um, when it comes to um, policing, I think as Pat and, and Jonathan mentioned, there's a lot of entrenched problems around, you know, things we haven't done. We haven't collected the data. We haven't uh, been able to answer problems that are entrenched and have lasted for, cent for, for a century. But I think that, you know, if you would have told me that the, the, the lexicon of defunding and ideas of re, re envisioning policing and in terms of public safety would be in the national imagination and in elections, as Aisha is saying, you know, I wouldn't have believed you a year ago. I wouldn't have believed you, you know, six months ago. And so I think that um, right now is a, is a moment to really to seize and, and take advantage because I don't think it's an accident that this, this consciousness raising is, raising is happening now where we're in the midst of a pandemic we have a shared sense of endangerment and that um, we need to see how we're connected to each other through problems that we once would have thought are isolated to different groups, but they're actually not. And so we need to uh, grapple with those issues on a large scale. And I'll just say one short thing, which is I think really giving uh, a, a human face to the reality of these violences really changes the world. And we saw that with George Floyd, we saw that with Breonna Taylor. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great, well, a huge thank you to both of you for this really um, important conversation. I know that this is just sort of a flavor of what we're gonna get into when we bring all four of you back for a much broader conversation. But I did want to say to everyone, please stay with us because after this break, we will bring all of today's forward thinkers back to have a lively discussion. Um, but first, we will watch a short clip from a film made by Professor Ralph to accompany his book, The Tortured Letters. Thank you both. Thank you. Letter one. An open letter to the boy and girl with matching airbrushed book bags on the corner of Lawndale Avenue and Sir Mac Road. I began to worry about police violence in Chicago back in the summer of 2004. That's when I saw you on your knees at the corner of South Lawndale Avenue and West Sir Mac Road. It's been more than a decade I know you're much older now, and yet, when I see black and brown teenagers of today's Chicago, I always return to that scene. Four police cars were parked along the curb. Six officers patted you down. Your bags were both white, each with a different word airbrushed in graffiti letters. Your names, I assumed, though I couldn't make them out from where I stood. I had moved to Chicago two weeks prior to this incident and it scared me for two reasons. I was worried that this was something that I too might face. At the same time, I was reliving a scene from my past. When I was around the same age as you were then, I found myself in a similar position 
my two older brothers and I had just moved from Baltimore to Columbia, Maryland. We decided to go to the mall. Before long, we realized a plainclothes police officer was following us from store to store. He eventually ordered us to stop. He frisked both of my brothers, who were 15 and 16, against a rail on the second floor. The cop took my eldest brother, Wale, through one of those doors that you never notice along the corridors of a mall until all of your senses are heightened and you notice everything. It would take four long hours for Wale to be released. When the police released you, I felt a similar kind of relief as I felt then. But I also felt a familiar combination of anger, frustration, and yes, fear. I cannot change the anger and frustration and fear you must have felt. All I can say is that if I could press rewind and go back to the moment that you too were released, this time I would say a few words to you. It was not your fault that you were stopped by the police. I know they probably suggested it was, but those accusations are just a way of concealing the open secret. The open secret is this. The kind of police harassment you faced has grown into torture and has even resulted in death, all because police violence is rooted in fear. Welcome back, everyone. I'm pleased to be joined by all four of us in one room to have some great conversation for about this last 20 minutes or so. Um, I did have some questions from the chat that I think I might start with, if I can read these quickly. Um, so one of the questions that I did have was around um, sort of, you know, some have suggested that solving the market failures of economic and opportunity disparities is too long term. And we are better off investing in interventions focused at symptoms and diseases instead of root causes. I'm curious, what are your views on this? Should we sort of prioritize symptoms over root causes um, to sort of fix what we're seeing in the short term versus long term? Or do you see this perhaps maybe as of a more parallel strategy when we're thinking about changing policing, changing the criminal justice system that you probably might need both, where you need incremental change as well as some of the long-term thinking. So um, Professor Sharkey, I'll start with you. And then if others wanna jump in, please feel free to do so. Thanks, Bria. This is an important question because when there is a surge of violence, uh, which, you know, there has been a spike in violence this summer. It's not nearly as widespread as media coverage or, or uh, certain politicians would suggest. But when there is this kind of, of spike in violence, it does change the discourse. OK, it, it does change the the top level agenda of policymakers, both from a local level all the way to the, the national level. So there is this need to kind of combine, in, in my mind at least, there is a need to combine a short-term perspective and think about what kind of investments can we do right now to confront violence in New York City at this moment? Can we, for instance, can we refund the summer jobs program that for a while lost its funding this summer and then some of the funding was reinstituted? So that's the kind of uh, can we open community centers for longer uh, stretches uh, of the day? That's obviously a, um, a different conversation this year than most, but what kinds of interventions can we carry out right now that are going to try, that are going to potentially reduce the surge of violence that's going on? And then if we want to think seriously about how do we create stronger communities, how do we create places where we don't see such severe inequality across communities that generates there or that at least makes uh, communities vulnerable to to violence then we do need to think about about long-term solutions and long-term investments and just a shift in approach um, and it's not i mean it is the root causes but it's it's really just what are the basic investments that should be made in every community across the country to make sure it's a safe thriving, prosperous community. These types of investments are taken for granted in most communities. And I think a lot of people studying this issue are just arguing that those basic investments should be extended to every community across the country. 
Yeah, if I could just piggyback on that. I mean, and I think that even in the short term, it's essential to know the difference between an evidence-based difference between the the root causes and um, what's happened in the immediate context. So even as Patrick is saying that, like in the short time, we might be able to address uh, address the spike in violence by investing in a job program or something like that. That's because we know that violence, you know, spikes when people are unemployed, right? But if we, for instance, thought that violence was spiking because uh, too many police officers got COVID and we weren't, uh, they weren't able to do their regular uh, patrols, then the short-term solution would be to, you know, get hire more police or something like that, right? And so we have to know the difference between uh, what actually causes violence, you know? And, and so we have a spike, but it's a predictable spike in the context of a, epi- a, a pandemic, you know? People are losing their jobs. They're losing their homes. We would expect um, alcoholism to, to rise and drug abuse to rise. We would expect um, mental health issues to rise, right? And we would expect a correspondence rise in violence and crime because of that. And so, but we have to know that those are the, the things that motivate crime and not just the um, uh, culture or behavioral attitudes of certain groups. And I think that's, that's an issue. Professor Ramola, I think of you when you um, think of you, I think of like what you were mentioning in the first panel discussion about using data as a way to empower and educate and inform. And I think sort of building off of Professor Lawrence's point or Professor Ralph's point that we know the data, we know what the data is saying, sort of how can we actually use the data for good? You mentioned this earlier about using data for good. But this is a perfect example where where we would like to use the data for good. Yeah, I think um, there are there are many things that are coming through in the social science on these issues, and then there are many unanswered questions that we've lacked the data and the technology to to answer. So it, it's not simply as clear cut as we know what to do. Let's let's move forward. Um, I'm optimistic because we're getting newer, new and better data all the time and, and new and improved techniques all the time. Um, and I, th- I, I totally agree with the other panelists that this isn't really, this can't be an either or decision as to um, whether to pursue uh, short term uh, incremental reform or bigger systemic change. These, these two things need to work uh, in parallel. Um, uh, but I, I do think um, it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't, uh, we didn't capitalize on some of the things we can do in the near term based on evidence that could make a real difference in people's lives while uh, bigger systemic changes that are going to take much more, uh, they're going to be much uh, bigger of a political lift and take many more years to implement um, that, you know, we need to, we need to uh, make, make gains where we can, when we can. And so uh, there's, there's all, there's all kinds of research that suggests things we can do. Uh, I mentioned scaling back aggressive tactics that aren't giving the purported benefits. Um, we also have pretty good evidence that simple oversight techniques within police agencies uh, can drastically, drastically curtail um, abusive practices like stopping people on the street for no reason, which often you know, leads to uh, uh, traumatic events or, or even uh, violence or death. Um, so we need to be looking at all these things. And, and, um, and I think... Uh, we're going we're gonna to have much uh, clearer answers in the near future um, as we get a better sense of what police are doing and how these various reforms can alter their behavior. Um, and on this question of reforms, I think a lot of you have sort of looked at the role of police unions, what role that they're having, what we're seeing now, quite frankly, with the um, police officer shootings that happen and how um, they've been protecting law enforcement from um, charges from the prosecutor's office or oftentimes are sort of just left unscathed. We have a question from the chat that is asking about um, what do you guys think about police unions being resistant to change and are there ways that we can sort of use them as allies as we're sort of thinking
thinking about transforming policing and making more progressive changes to hopefully um, make communities safer and make communities better. Does anyone want to take that or should I sort of just direct it to someone in particular? <laughs> um, I can, I can uh, not answer necessarily about police unions in particular, but I do think it's important to, um, to think along the lines of the, the sort of the types of uh, cultural spaces that policing uh, practices uh, enable or disable, right? And, and I think one of the things that um, I was looking at in my research was how um, poli police academies in particular and how police officers are trained um, really circumscribes certain types of um, aggressive tactics and even physical um, expectations of what an officer should be or how an officer, officer should act. And um, one of the things that the Obama administration was trying to transform was address the, um, the sort of shift around a kind of expectation of officers to uh, portray a kind of warrior uh, in, in, in terms of um, their approach to policing. And, and, and there was a move in this uh, sort of from warrior to guardian, guardian um, that was um, sort of the thought behind it was that if we, if we find people who are sort of trying to be caretakers and we, um, uh, and we train them to be police officers, then that will somehow resolve the issue around the kind of um, unnecessary use of force and ag aggressive tactics that you see happening. But, um, but what you see with ethnographic research with policing is that um, oftentimes people's, um, the, the ways in which the, the police officers uh, act with each other also produces different factors, right? And the elements of uh, a, 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 a sort of aggressive masculinity and, and how those, um, it, you know, it, in, impact both, you know, officers of, of any gender, of any race and ethnicity who are either brought into or not brought into the fold. So I think on a different level, we have to address not only the sort of embedded and entrenched, entrenched, um, you know, sort of techniques of policing that that occur and that get taught to and trained in policing um, academies, but also some of the ways in which um, lobbies and unions are tied to older politics that don't often allow for uh, for 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 a, a change of mind in um, in in all ranks, right? Um, and the people that are trying to make uh, you know differences in the ways in which uh, in the ways in which police even operate on the ground, like what you know, why would there be a need for police, for instance, to come to a scene if it's a mental health call, right? Can we have instead of police officers? Other um, other forms, but you know the investment in policing as a uh, as itself a sort of uh, you know financial um, and, and sort of venture and, and infrastructure it, it, that is tied to police unions is is indeed part of the issue, right? Um, that needs to be so. So I think it's not to say that uh, the unions themselves are inherently bad, but it is um, to say that. The ways in which the politics have um, have produced a, different types of cultural formations makes it very difficult in, to change those structures without a real look at how they engage and interact within them. I think that's such a good point. Um, it, it's also bringing to mind the question about how do you build allies? How do you build coalitions in this movement? And um, Maybe Professor Ralph, you can answer this question. As we're thinking about sort of adversarial allies, how do we, how do we sort of understanding that there is a, a spectrum or a continuum of where people are, where people are at in terms of how they feel comfortable with reforms? How do you get to have people, you know, start to move and move away from the status quo or what they're familiar with or the things they want to reinforce to the changes that eventually we want to make? that you all are talking about in terms of what community safety should look like, what public safety should look like, uh, you know, having more investments in the street lights rather than the blue lights, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think on the one hand, um, it, I, both Aisha and I have done a lot of research with uh, police officers and even high ranking police officers, police chiefs, 
who would say like, yes, we want to stop, you know, police violence as well. We want to address the issue. You know, we can't, we're facing a barrier with the unions or whatever, even when we fire someone, they can get rehired. And so there's an idea that, um, you know, why wouldn't a, a union be invested in uh, making sure that police violence is eradicated too, you know? And so there's, there's, and, and I think Aisha is saying that part of the issue is like the, the cultural that, cult, the, the culture that's formed within the union to think that it's us against them, that police are always under attack, that the public will, is, is against the police and that they're in a fight and a struggle to maintain their place in society. Um, and so, you know, how do we look at the, the issue itself and, uh, amongst people who are willing in good faith to uh, deal with the issue? And I think part of your question goes to this idea of reform versus say abolition, right? And so how do we think of, and it goes back to our larger conversation of, you know, incremental change versus uh, structural transformations. And how do we think about the people who want structural transformations versus incremental change? And I think part of it is to recognize, I think as all of us are saying, that these things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, that, you know, in, in, in doing incremental change, we could also be thinking of long-term investments that would make the entire society more, more safe. But they can be mutually exclusive, right? And so I think people are often speaking out of the fear that, you know, if we speak about reform, then reform will be used as a foil to just invest in more policing. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be, for one, take lessons from history and, and see how that happens, the process by which that happens. But when we're thinking through reforms, we have to, to think about are the reforms bolstering police presence or, or giving police more autonomy and giving them more resources to make their own decisions? Or are we putting in place a system of accountability that has different actors that provides checks and balances or that um, um, takes away some of the aggressive and violence, police, violent police tactics that we know are ineffective. And so I think that uh, we, there's a way to do reform that, it, that doesn't um, hinder long-term possibilities for structural transformation, but we have to be intentional from the outset about how we're thinking about those challenges. So we have a couple of questions in the chat that are asking um, sort of self-reflection questions about how to be uh, anti-racist, how to be more empathetic um, to a system that is quite frankly more adversary, particularly to people of color. And I'm curious if you all have any advice um, that we can sort of give back to the audience about um, thinking, uh, sort of being more humanizing, thinking about who actually is being impacted and not so much of a punishment perspective, but thinking about the reforms that we're all talking about in a much more dehuman dehumanizing um, way of thinking. So I don't know, Professor Sharkey, do you have anything that you wanna sort of just kick off with you on that question? Well, that's, that's a tough question. I'd be interested in hearing what the other panelists say when, when kind of, I think we've been on this path in the US uh, that has been very uh, stable and consistent. And it was well before 1968, but really from 1968 forward, I think when in, in the 1960s, a whole set of, of challenges became very visible in, in cities. And, and this included widespread joblessness and economic dislocation and also pollution, the first signs of, of climate change became very visible, in addition to social unrest and a rise in violence uh, and political protests on a large scale. So all of these things came in the 1960s uh, 
And, and there was, there were these debates about how to respond and, and different answers came up throughout that decade. And then toward the end of that decade and into the 1970s, I think the United States settled on an approach, and this was not a, um, a, a settlement that was shared by the entire population, but I think the, the federal government settled on an approach that, that relied heavily on two principles, abandonment and punishment. Uh, and by abandonment, I mean extracting resources from the state uh, for federal resources, but also state power shifted towards suburban districts away from central city districts. Um, and, and so central cities started getting much less of the share of their budgets from federal sources. Uh, institutions started to crumble within central cities without the basic investments they needed uh, that every institution, every community needs to thrive. And then a focus on punishment. We are going to respond to this set of problems through investments in law enforcement, through investments in the criminal justice system. And that started the nation on a path toward mass incarceration, aggressive policing, intensive surveillance, um, and not much has changed in the 50 years since. So this is a long-winded way of saying that this idea of empathy, this idea of restorative justice, this idea of investment, just investment, okay, uh, in every community across the country hasn't been a central part of our discourse in a long, long time. The question now is how to shift that entire discourse, that entire model of dealing with entrenched and severe urban inequality. Um, and, and that's really the challenge that we're all facing. That's the big picture challenge that kind of underlies this whole discussion in my mind. Anyone else wanna weigh in on this question? Sure. Um, I, I guess going back to the importance of empathy, um, I do think this is very important, not only from like an ethical um, or, or moral standpoint, but as a, just from a scientific standpoint, I mean, you need to understand what people are going through as best you can, or you're going to get the wrong answer in your research. Um, and so I do, you know, I do quantitative statistical mm -hmm. work, um, but I recognize that the best quantitative analyses have qualitative components. And that means uh, talking to people, listening to people, reading, uh, you know, scholars and voices from diverse backgrounds. And it's, you know, why, why work, um, ethnographic work like Aisha does is so important. And why I think um, this is such a great panel because it combines sort of those two approaches, which are both completely necessary for understanding these issues. Um, I, I would also like to follow on, I think the, the, com the conversation and I think the, the question is really a crucial one, especially in kind of where we're at right now as I understand it and how it was, um, Relayed, but I think, you know, uh, there has, you know, we're we're at a sort of reckoning. I think in in the country right now um, that is a long time coming, and um, and I and I think one of the things that's really different about this moment, which I think is part of why what we are doing is, is really important, has to also do with the the fact that we've never really acknowledged, um, you know, the history of racism as a sort of you know, governmental approach or strategy um, to uh, to inequality. Um, there's lots of wonderful research that that has you know addressed this and has made it clear that this is the case. But there's never sort of been uh, a time where our, our governmental platform, even with the Obama administration, to really kind of sort of take it on and address that um, that there's uh, that structural racism is an inherent part of how. Um, inequality it continues to persist. And I think one of the things that we are experiencing right now, and this goes back to the question from the previous panel when we were asked about sort of Black Lives Matter and what's happened, is that um, we're able to bring together the sort of qualitative and quantitative research that's evidence-based, that, that, that has you know, no question around how crucial uh, any type of approach to inequality must really take uh, seriously um, uh, uh, strategies on, on undoing racism, right? In, in not only in our country, but globally. Um, and I think that that's something that you cannot do without truly humanizing uh, the, the, the data and the, um, and the research on, on both sides. And I think it's something that we, we have to take seriously as, as academics. 
uh, doing any type of work that has an aim in transformative justice work. That is a perfect point to end on. It's really unfortunate that we are now at time and I feel like we could continue having this discussion for a much longer amount if we could. Um, but I do wanna thank all four of you, Professor Felicio de Jesus, Professor Ralph, Professor Mamolo, Professor Sharkey. Thank you all for a wonderful, inspiring and reinvigorating conversation on this topic. And thank you everyone for watching and tuning in at home. Um, and until next time, keep up the forward thinking. Thanks, Bria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for engaging in this Forward Fest. Be sure to keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag Princeton Forward. And visit forwardthinking.princeton.edu to access more forward thinking content, including a downloadable resource guide for this month's Forward Fest. We're so glad that you've been a part of this Forward Fest. Until next time, keep up the forward thinking.